I just want to thank each and every single one of you guys here tonight for coming out in this weather and weathering the storm, so to say, all together. So thank you guys all for that. Remember, we are a community. So I want to make sure that you guys all turn to the people beside you that you might not know and be in community with them, connect in community with them, and let's just be human beings together. Um, my name is Misty. I'm from Alberta. I'm from Calgary. I was doing a, bringing the Alberta connection here. I met one of my girlfriends from my hometown, uh, Okotoks, Tanya, in the crowd too. So we're over here supporting you guys in British Columbia. You guys are doing big things. We appreciate that. And I just wanted to make sure that we are all ensuring that we connect in community well tonight. So remember, we do have a lot of information coming out. We do have some amazing doctors that are going to speak. We have, of course, the lovely, beautiful, and, and energetic Svetlana, who's taking this charge by the horns. And we're very, very excited to give you guys a lot of information. But let's not Which forget, while we're doing this information, to connect with one another, all right? Because we're going to form all the new communities coming up. So we have to be tight-knit. Because what are they trying to do to us, you guys, these last couple years? That's right, they're trying to divide us. They're trying to isolate us. They're trying to make us stay six feet apart, so we probably want to get as close as we possibly can. <laughs> this is my good friend, Travis Cross. I also just ran into him as well. Very excited, I'm very excited to connect in community with a whole lot more of you guys here, personally, in real life, out here in the cold, while we warm each other up a little bit. <laughs> All right, so I didn't know I was speaking, I just did this off the cuff, but I don't know where, uh... <laughs> Kyle left me here. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. So, I do want to say, because I did just leave a meeting with Ezra Wellness and Svetlana, we tr we've been traveling from Vancouver to here, and um, there's some really exciting things happening, you guys. We have donors stepping up to build infrastructure, and, and we're asking that the community comes forth and we all do this together as well. So let's think about, hey guys, <laughs> Like Kyle's on live, Kyle's on live, like everything. So Kyle's back. Thank you so much. Oh, I want. Are you going on? Hot duck. Okay, okay, perfect. Can We've we got Doctor Hop here. Thank you so much, Doctor Hop. Come on up. Thank you. Anyway. I'm going to climb right over here. Yep. I want to welcome you all this evening. I can see that Canada is hungry for truth. I can see that you are all tired of this pandemic. And we have gathered here together to hear truth. So thank you for coming. I am sorry that uh, we don't have seats for everybody. We never anticipated so many people coming. Last night we met in, in Kelowna, we had exactly the same problem. We had to move everyone outside and they filled up the hall again this morning. We did it twice. People are hungry for truth. So I, my name is Dr. Charles Hoff. I'm a family doctor. I, I live and work in Lytton in the Fraser Canyon where I have been for 28 years. I came to Canada in 1990 from South Africa the land of my birth, and I came to Canada because it was a land of freedom and a land of opportunity. And I'm very, very sad to see what has happened to this country since that time. But we are here together to stand for freedom and for truth. So I wanted to take this time, <laughs> I wanted to take this time, a oh, closer, sorry, yeah. I wanted to tell you my story about what happened to me in Lytton. 
When we heard at the beginning of last year about this dangerous new virus that had appeared out of Wuhan in China, I, like everyone else, was worried. I have been an emergency room physician for 31 years, and I was worried because there were stories of doctors and nurses dying while they were treating these desperately ill people, people who were dying fighting for breath. And I knew that I was going to be in the front lines. I, was, I knew that I would have to be there in the emergency room intubating these people. I was worried and I was fearful. And so I, like all of you, was glued to the television and my, my, my computer trying to find out information about COVID. Bluetooth connected. But by February of last year, it became apparent that the survival rate from people who had COVID was the same as the flu. So I was immediately very puzzled as to why there was so much panic and restrictions over a, a viral infection that killed mostly the frail elderly and had the same survival rate as the flu. It made absolutely no sense to me that there should be so much panic and so many restrictions and lockdowns and masks and social distancing for a, an, an illness that had a survival rate about the same as the flu. And then we heard about the new vaccines that were being developed. And so I started researching the history of gene-based vaccines. And I found out that, that after the, the uh, SARS virus in 2002, attempts had been made to make a vaccine against coronavirus. And it had all been a dismal failure. Every attempt to make a vaccine before this pandemic had failed because either the, the, the effectiveness of the vaccine just didn't last and it faded out in a few months, or it left the, the laboratory animals which they tested them on even more vulnerable to the, to the virus than if they had never been vaccinated. That is a medical condition called pathogenic priming. And so attempts to develop these new vaccines were abandoned. That was in 2006. So I was concerned about these new vaccines and when we heard that they were going to be ready to be rolled out starting in December of 2020 and January of 2021, it seemed to me to be rather too quick because it normally takes five or 10 years to develop a new vaccine. Firstly, to, de to decide whether it is safe and secondly, to decide if it is effective. So any vaccine that is made in such a short time with a completely new technology okay, no, no. with a completely new technology that had never been tried on humans before where they had not done any animal trials on these vaccines and with absolutely no long-term safety data i was concerned and so by march of this year when the vaccine rollout in england and in europe was into its third month and AstraZeneca had already been shut down in 12 countries in Europe, I sent an email to a group of medical health professionals in Lillooet and the Lytton area asking the question, there is now evidence of serious life-threatening side effects from these shots. This is an experiment. Is it ethical to continue with this experiment with such clear evidence of harm? because the Hippocratic Oath is to do no harm. And every vaccine injury is a medically induced disease to a previously healthy person. Doctors should not be doing that, especially against a virus that has the mortality rate the same as the flu. This is not Ebola virus. This is a, this is a, a virus with a survival rate of 99.97% in people under the age of 60 and 99.7% 99 in the over 60 age group. 
This is not a dangerous virus, any more than the flu is. My superiors at Interior Health immediately gave me a very stern reprimand. They told me that I was not allowed to question the safety of this experiment. Well, they didn't call it an experiment, but that's what it is. <laughs> they told me that I was not allowed to say anything negative against these vaccines in our healthcare facility. They informed me that I was going to be reported to the College of Physicians and Surgeons because I was causing vaccine hesitancy. And I was told that if I had any questions about the safety of these shots, they should not be addressed to my colleagues, but to the doctor who, who is the medical health officer for the vaccine rollout in the thompson Nicola area. So I complied with their requests. And I did not say anything negative about the shots in our healthcare facility in Lytton. But in the days that followed, I started to see more and more very serious neurological problems in my own patients who had had their first Moderna shot in January. So I sent a letter to that doctor, the medical health officer, to say, Please, could you explain to me what the mechanism of injury is for all? And I explained what I was seeing in my patients. And I said, please, could you tell me, as their doctor, how should I be treating these injuries? And I got no answer. In fact, that letter was sent to the College of Physicians and Surgeons as a complaint because I was questioning the vaccine. About six weeks after that, a lady in, in, our, in, in the community of Lytton came into the emergency room quite sick after having had her COVID shot. And she was feverish and she had a terrible headache and abdominal pains and vomiting. And she was worried because she had had COVID five weeks before and her only symptoms were, was tiredness and loss of appetite for 10 days. And then she had a COVID shot and got way more sick from the shot than she got from COVID. So she came into the emergency room thinking that something serious must be wrong. Why was the shot worse than COVID? So the emergency room nurse phoned me. I was at home. It was a Saturday evening. And I said to the nurse, that patient who has come in with this vaccine injury had COVID five weeks ago. Please, will you tell her she doesn't need her second shot? And I explained to the nurse the research that was done in Singapore of last year. And I'll explain the research to you because everyone needs to know about this. This, I explained to this nurse the value of natural immunity against COVID. Because there are now more than 120 scientific studies to show the value and effectiveness of natural immunity against COVID. And our medical health authorities completely ignore all of that science. But I explained to this nurse that when COVID-19 appeared, nobody knew how long anybody who had recovered from it would stay immune to it. How long, what would be the durability of natural immunity after a natural infection with COVID? And would that immunity cover other variants? So I explained to that nurse that last year, 2020, scientists in Singapore at Duke University in Singapore managed to track down people who had recovered from COVID-19 back in 2002 and 2003. Now, th that was called the SARS-1 virus. COVID-19 is called SARS-CoV-2. It is the second SARS virus to come out of that same Wuhan laboratory. So what these scientists did, because COVID was a brand new virus, and if it's a brand new virus, how are you going to know how long natural immunity lasts for? Because it's a new virus. You know, time and truth go hand in hand. But the best way to find out was to take the closest virus that we had to it, which was SARS-1, and track down people that had recovered from that 
and see if 18 years later they were still immune to it. So they collected blood from these people. They checked for T-cell immunity. This is not antibodies. This is T-cell immunity. This is the long-lasting immunity. When, when you are a child and you have chicken pox and you remain immune to chicken pox for the rest of your life, it's not antibodies. It is T-cell immunity that gives you lifelong immunity. So they looked at the T cells of those people who had the first SARS virus and they found that 18 years later they were still completely immune to it. So then what they did was they looked at those people's T cells and they tested them against COVID-19 to see if those people who had had the first SARS virus would also be immune to COVID-19. And they found that they were. And the relevance of this is that the first SARS virus, SARS-1, and the second SARS virus, SARS-CoV-2, are 20% different. And yet our immune system is so amazing that it can protect us not only for at least 18 years, but against a virus that is 20% different. Now, the relevance of this is not just that the immunity is long-lasting. The relevance of this is that all these new variants that you keep getting told about, the most, the, all of them are less than 1% different from the parent coronavirus. Less than 1% different. So if yeah, your yeah, immune so system... No, no, just hold on, what please. No. The, uh, if your immune system can recognize a virus that is 20% different, it will have no difficulty with recognizing a variant that is less than 1% difference. And the fact that the public health authorities refuse to recognize the validity of natural immunity shows that they are simply not following the science. They are simply interested in getting a shot into every arm whether you need it or not. So that nurse that I explained that to did her duty as a nurse and they do a report, a handover at the end of their shift to their supervisor and she mentioned that I had asked this, I had asked her to tell this patient that the patient didn't need their second shot and in fact that nurse told me that she was not allowed to tell the patient that she didn't need a second shot. She was not allowed to tell this patient who was immune to COVID that she didn't need a second shot. So I said to her, well, tell the patient to come to my office and I will explain the science to them. Because if you already have natural immunity to COVID and you get a shot, you are much more likely to be injured by that shot than if you'd never had COVID because you don't need the shot. So the supervisor then reported that to Interior Health. Shortly after that, I got a phone call followed by a registered letter telling me that I was effectively fired from the emergency room. After working as an emergency room physician for 31 years, I am no longer allowed to work as an emergency room physician for explaining to a nurse why somebody is, who is already immune to a virus does not need to be vaccinated against it. Meanwhile, more and more patients were coming into my office with serious vaccine injuries. I have six people in my medical practice who now find they cannot walk or exert themselves the way they used to before. I have one fellow who would walk every week to my office, would walk two miles to my office and two miles home to get a shot for his arthritis. He's, he now is 10 weeks since his shot and it tells me that he cannot do more than a quarter of a mile. One eighth of what he could walk before ever since his shot. And I have six people like that in my practice. I have three people in my practice who have weakness of both hands, so severe that they cannot open a jar. One lady who cannot open a door if it's got a round doorknob, because even with both hands, they are not strong enough to turn a doorknob. I have another gentleman who has great difficulty 
pronouncing words. He knows the words he wants to say, but he just can't say them anymore. Memory difficulties. I have two, uh, two patients who have a terrible problem with electric shocks and jolts that shoot down their limbs. That drive them crazy because it feels like they're being electrocuted. Neurological injuries. And so I then sent a letter to Dr. Bonnie Henry asking her what the mechanism of injury for this experimental shot was and how I should be treating it. And again, I got absolutely no response. How would she know? This is an experiment. So I then set out to try to discover for myself what these so-called experts did not know. And I spoke to brilliant scientists and immunologists from around the world, and I discovered that contrary to the claims of the vaccine manufacturers, these shots, unlike other conventional vaccines, do not just stay in your arm. That within 15 minutes, they are being circulated around your body. And in fact, 75% of the vaccine ends up circulating around every part of your body in your bloodstream. Which means that those, those little packets of synthetically produced RNA, which is a little a gene for making a spike protein, end up getting absorbed into your capillary, into the, the cells around your capillaries in every part of your body, in your brain, in your lungs, in your heart, in your muscles, in every organ in your body. And wherever they're absorbed into those cells, there the genes are released, your body recognizes this as, that, this as a gene and starts manufacturing trillions and trillions of spike proteins. Now, when those spike proteins are in a virus, it is those proteins that make up the shell of the virus. That's what makes a coronavirus look like a, a spiky round ball. You've all seen the pictures of them. That's what gives it its name. It looks like the spikes on a crown. The problem is, when these spikes are made by your body and not by the virus, they're in the wrong place. They're in your cells and they're in the cells around your blood vessels. And so those spike proteins, because they can't form part of the viral capsule, they form part of the cell wall of your own cells. And the cells that they're in is the cells around your blood vessels. So now these little spikes are going to be protruding into your blood vessels. And when that cell dies, those spikes are released into your bloodstream and will circulate around your body and your blood. And autopsies of people who have died from their COVID shots have now revealed these spike proteins in every organ of the body. But I still needed to know, so what happened to my patients? How could I treat this? What was the mechanism of injury? And was this theory at that point of the spiky lining of the blood vessels true? Now, the way our blood circulation works, we have little cells in our bloodstream called blood platelets. And the purpose of a blood platelet is to cause blood clots. The purpose of a blood platelet is to recognize a damaged vessel and to block it to stop bleeding. So that when you fall down and graze your knee, or when you cut yourself, that vessel that is damaged then has a rough surface at the point of damage. And when a little platelet comes down that vessel and it hits the rough spot, its job is to immediately initiate a clot to block that vessel to stop you bleeding. That is the purpose of platelets. But the problem is, when you now have all these, these little spikes in your capillary networks, when the platelet comes through that vessel and hits those spikes, it will interpret this as a damaged vessel and it will block that vessel. Just as smoking can be predicted to cause cancer because of all of the carcinogens in it, these shots can be predicted to cause blood clots because of the way they work. They produce spikes. And spikes in your blood cause clots. 
But when these clots are in capillary networks, those clots are so tiny and so microscopic that they will not be visible on an MRI scan or on a CT scan or on any form of medical imaging because they are just too small and they will be scattered throughout your body. So the only way that I could test this out to see if this was true is to do the test that we do in the emergency room called a D-dimer test. And if an emergency room doctor is concerned that a person might have a blood clot somewhere in their body, whether it be in their lungs or in their leg or in their heart or, any, you know, you can get clots anywhere in your body, we do this test called a D-dimer test, which will detect a recent blood clot. And so I started doing D-dimer blood tests on my own patients. People who came into my office and I would ask them if they'd had their shot and, you know, how's it going? And, you know, because I was, I was horrified at what I was seeing. So I was trying to see how many people had been injured. And if people told me that they'd had their shot the week before, I would say, I'm trying to investigate this. Would you be willing to go to the lab with this piece of paper, get a blood test, and I want to see if you had microvascular clots, and I will phone you and tell you what the result is. And what I found in my own patients, that more than 50% of them had evidence of clotting, even though they had no significant vaccine side effects. These were people who had no idea that their shot had done permanent damage to their body. These are not vaccine injured people. These are people who shot, thought their shot went fine. But the problem with that is that a clotted vessel is permanently damaged. A clotted vessel never unblocks. It is ruined forever. And so if you have thousands or millions of blocked blood vessels in your body, that damage is permanent. And with each successive booster, it is going to accumulate. So this is like Russian roulette. You don't know which part of your body is going to be affected yet. We know that these vials are not all equal. Some are far more lethal than others. Investigations of people who have died from these shots have found that 50% of all the vaccine deaths, sorry, 100% of all vaccine deaths have occurred from 5% of the vaccine lots. If you look on your, if you've got a vaccine card or a vaccine passport, you will see a lot number on it. So they found that 5% of the lot numbers caused 100% of the deaths. This is, this is like Russian roulette. You don't know which kind of clot shot you're going to get. Are you going to get the death shot or are you going to get the saline? Because clearly they are not all equal. So all I could do as these people's doctor, who now had these horrible neurological and pulmonary injuries, was to tell them to take aspirin, which reduces the adhesion of platelets to one another. I had no cure for them. And I now have 10 people in my small medical practice in Lytton who are permanently disabled from their shot. And the cruelty and the stupidity of this is that those people who have refused to have more of what hurt them are now called unvaxxed people because they've only had one shot. Because they refuse to have more of what hurt them, they are now being punished like all of those people who are vaccine free because they refused to have more of these poisonous shots. Unfortunately, this present crop of COVID vaccines has now broken all the records for the most dangerous vaccine in history. There used to be an international standard for new vaccines that if any new vaccine killed anywhere between 25 and 15 people, it was shut down. If you look on the VAERS, the VAERS is the vaccine injury reporting system from the US, the last numbers I saw were up until the 26th of November. 19 and a half thousand people who died suddenly and unexpectedly after a COVID shot. 19 and a half thousand. And we know that only about 1% of vaccine injuries are ever actually reported. So the number is 100 times higher than that. 
and yet the public health authorities insist that they are safe. There are now almost a million vaccine injuries reported on the VAR system just in the US. So why then in Canada are we told that these are safe? Well, I want to tell you firsthand about Canada's vaccine injury reporting system because I have submitted about 14 vaccine injury reporting forms and there, this is a nine page form that takes about a half an hour to fill out and it's a pain in the neck. And all 14 that I have submitted get sent back to me to say, nope, these are not vaccine injuries, these are all coincidences. In other words, when I as a doctor try to report what these shots have done to my own patients, it gets censored higher up. And it never goes into the statistics and then you are told that the injuries are very rare. So not only do we have a censorship of doctors that get told that you're not allowed to question the safety of a new experimental treatment, but we have got censorship of vaccine injury reporting so that you can be told that they're safe. The College of Physicians and Surgeons, who has warned me and all other doctors that we are not allowed to question public health policy, has said to the public of BC that you need to be getting your information on COVID from reliable sources. So you need to decide who those reliable sources are. I don't think it's coming through your television set. Because if we, generally if we ask people, when you've got a group of people who can see the madness of what's going on and ask them how many are watching TV, it's usually none of them. Because the people that watch TV believe the lies. And the people that don't watch TV can see the lies. It is, the question has been asked, why were the Amish not affected by COVID? And the answer is they don't have TVs. <laughs> so the best way to get rid of this fear because the real pandemic is fear. Fear of the virus and now fear of the unvaccinated. The best way to get rid of fear, there's a button on the bottom of your TV, it says off. You just push that button and you move your TV into the garage and the fear goes away and you will enjoy your life. So I think what we're gonna do now is we can, um, we'll, I'm sure you don't want to be staying here too long, but I'm quite willing to, to, to answer questions to the best of my ability. And if there's any other information that anyone um, would like to, um, to ask, um, and what I'll do is, um, I'll, I'll try and repeat, if, if, if you've got a question, it might be good to sort of come forward so that I can hear it, and then I'll repeat the question so everyone else, or maybe actually it might even be better to come up here. Okay, but we're going to just let me do a little bit of what's going on here. Okay, okay, okay. Hi, everybody. Ben, let's give a big hand for Dr. Yeah. Charles Huff. So my name is Carrie Simpson, and I am one of the organizers for the Doctors on Tour. And we have had just an amazing turnout at every single event, everywhere we go. And this is just awesome here tonight. All right, Kyle, I want to thank Kyle Cardinal for helping organize this. Awesome job. All right, and you're live streaming this, right? All right, so I made a mistake earlier this morning. I said we were live streaming this, and we are live streaming this. Okay, so we have a competition going, you guys. Every community has to say hi to the online community. Let's see if you can give the best hello. Everybody, hello. So I just want to just share a couple of things as we go on and then we're, we're, we're trying to figure out because there's so many, how many people, how we're gonna get this doctor in there and the other two doctors out here so you can hear them all, okay? We will do this. <laughs> yeah, they're used to shift work, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> so a couple of things. I just want to tell you how amazing Canadians are. You guys are not good Canadians. You are great Canadians. And I'm not going to take up too much of the time. I know there will be some questions and we'll, we'll get to some of you now and then more of you later. But I just want to ask you to do your part. You know, we have a team of people that's working hard. I'll need them inside, thanks. Working hard to make sure all these chores are pulled off with just excellence, okay? Um, we are doing this and there's only so much we can do. So you guys have to take the initiative and please sign up on the sign up sheet so we can get a hold of you. You're gonna want us to get a hold of you. You wanna know why? Because you're going to want a copy of my letter asking Bonnie Henry to resign. And you're going to want to be part of our initiative. BC has one of the few provinces recall an initiative act. That means we have people power here in this province, you guys. And come the spring, we are already in gear, we are gonna ignite an initiative. An initiative allows us to make a law, change a law, or get rid of a law. We are gonna create a law. You know what law we're gonna make? That it's illegal to fire anyone because they won't participate in a medical experiment. But we need your help and we need to know where you are because the Initiative Act is very crafty. We have a lot of work to do in a very short amount of time as far as getting signatures. We need volunteers. We know, need to know where you are because I want this to be the most successful initiative ever to happen in British Columbia. So you can go to 300k.ca, that's a website, it'll take you to the website, you just join, either that or put your name, but you have to write legibly because I get in trouble if I bring 300 sheets back and people can't read your email addresses, okay? And I get in enough trouble without getting in trouble from the people who are helping us out here. So please, take the initiative, no pun intended, um, and make sure we have your contact information, okay? We live stream all of these events on my Facebook page, Carrie Simpson, it's K-A-R-I. Use these as tools to give to your friends and family. We had a videographer traveling with us. There will be videos posted on the website so you will get information when that happens again so you can share, and there's so much more coming down. And there's one more reason why you want to be on our info list. You want to know when the doctors are coming back and when the Be Strong Stay Free Tour happens. Yeah. And that will give you tools on what we can do to unite Canadians across this country who want to end this lunacy. We know this isn't about COVID. This is not, well, all right, let me ask. Let's just see. Who out there believes the government really cares about your health and well-being? Not one hand? Good crowd. All right. And I can go on and on, but it's cold, and I know you want to talk to the doctors, but we're going to be releasing information on how the government has manipulated this situation. We're going to be releasing information on the grants that the federal government put out paying coaches of underprivileged children's basketball teams to convince their kids to get vaccinated. And there are thousands of those examples, you guys. They are using our tax dollars against us. And I say, enough is enough. Yeah. All right, so thank you all for coming out. And I hope next time we're here to see twice as many people. No, I'm kidding. I think we got the whole town, don't we? <laughs> hey, there was a guy from North Vancouver inside, okay? All right, so thank you. I'm going to give you back to Dr. Hoff, and we'll see what sta stage of the program the other doctors are in. Um, I think it's a good idea to line up here for your questions, and maybe you can just share the microphone. Okay, and I'll, you will get warm and inside in, in due time, all right? Okay, if they let you in.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Did you have you got a question? So what I, I think we're going, what we're going to do, if you have a question, please form a line here so that we do it in an orderly way and that people each get a turn. One of the reasons why I and Dr. Malthaus and, and uh, Dr. Maurice, who's, who's from Kamloops, are doing this tour is for the safety of our children. The government is, of Canada is determined to vaccinate every child. And I wanted to just share with you a couple of points about the vaccination of children that unfortunately you will not hear on your television set. As I mentioned before, COVID-19, one of the lies of the public health media is that COVID is a risk to everyone. It is not. The average age of those who have died with COVID in, in, in Canada is 83. The median age is 85. Just like the flu, this is a disease of the frail elderly. Children have a far lower chance of dying from COVID than they do from the flu. So I've got a couple of statistics that I wanted to give to you. Firstly, that children are a hundred times more likely to die from the COVID shot than they are from COVID. In other words, these shots are far more dangerous to children, a hundred times more dangerous to children than COVID is. Secondly, you might have heard of the myocarditis risk. And our medical health authorities will tell you it's a very low risk and it is very rare. My friend had a heart attack. Just as we can do a D-dimer test on people who have recently had their shot and find that more than 50% had clotting of which they may have been completely unaware, but nevertheless is a permanent injury, you can do a test called a troponin. Now this is a blood test that emergency room doctors do in the emergency room to see if there is damage to heart muscle. And one in 300 children, if you look at teenagers, one in 300 have an elevated troponin after their COVID shot. In other words, myocarditis, which is permanent, myocarditis is inflammation of heart muscle. And heart muscle, just like lung and brain and spinal cord, cannot regenerate. If it is damaged, the damage is permanent. Any child that gets myocarditis will live a shorter life because their heart is permanently damaged. So there is no such thing as mild myocarditis because that person then, as young as they might be, has a permanently damaged heart. A child's risk of being hospitalized with COVID is one in a hundred thousand. That's just being in hospital. And a, ch a child's chance of dying of COVID is one in a million. There has not been one single death with COVID in BC since the beginning of this pandemic in any, anyone under the age of 19, not one. And yet they're determined to vaccinate them all against a disease that poses no risk to them. This is all risk and no benefit. Many children are told that they need to get their COVID shot so that they can visit their grandparents or keep their teacher safe or their parents safe. You need to know that children do not spread COVID. It has now been discovered from a huge study done in Sweden that one of the safest, in fact, it was the safest profession to have in this pandemic is a teacher because children do not spread COVID. When children get COVID, they catch it from adults, not the other way around. So to, to, so to vaccinate a child in order to protect somebody else is scientific nonsense. It is all risk and no benefit to anyone. It is never appropriate to sacrifice the young to protect the old. 
We should not be sacrificing anyone, and least of all, our children. So I think we're now going to open this to questions. And um, would you like, yeah, I'll pass the microphone. Yes, sir. Okay. The question is, for those people who have already had a shot, and many, I know so many people who believed the government, that believed that this shot would keep them safe, and, and, and many people who had their shot believing it was to keep them safe, and then had to have another one in order to keep their job, what do they do? Once this shot is in your body, you cannot get it out. What do we do? The first thing you do is thank God that you're still alive. Secondly, you thank God that you have a body that is able to heal itself. And there are now, most people now know more people who have either died or been seriously injured from these shots than have died of COVID. So most people are starting to realize that these shots are more dangerous than COVID. So what can you do if you've already had the shots? Just don't have another one. It's a bit like smoking. If you've smoked for 30 or 40 years and now find you can't walk up the hills like you used to be able to do, there is nothing you can do to undo the damage except stop smoking and give your body a chance to heal itself. That's the only advice that I've got. Good advice. Next question. The question is, where is the ombudsman of BC? The ombudsman is, ombudsman is supposed to fight for the people. Why are they not doing that? That's a political question, not a medical question. But we do know that Justin Trudeau has given out a billion dollars to any province that will push these vaccines. And so I just, I know that the the, um, the coaches of sports teams are getting paid $10,000 each to make sure that there's, uh, the children under their charge gets vaccinated. First Nations group leaders are being paid to encourage their people to get vaccinated. Pe this is bribery. This, people are being paid to push these clot shots. And I think that is why people who can see that this is doing serious harm are not protecting the people of Canada. Unfortunately, follow the money, yep. and you'll maybe you'll find out why these crazy things are happening. Meanwhile, doctors like me and other others who are losing their jobs and and paying an enormous sacrifice for trying to educate others and speak truth are being punished for trying to warn people, while other people are getting payouts but there is blood on their hands. Any other questions? Uh, you can elaborate on the PCR test. Okay. And then I have one more question. Okay. Uh, explaining a little bit why vaccines are exempt from like the golden standard or their, their testing. Yeah, why that is. Why vaccines are exempt from that. Going through like a the, the, the study, right? they don't do you mean do the their... normal research? Yeah. Oh, like yeah. Why? yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so the two questions. The first is if I could just say something about the PCR test. And secondly, why these vaccines have not been subjected to the same um, scrutiny and the same safety testing as vaccines normally are. Firstly, the PCR test, the PCR stands for a polymerase chain reaction. This is a test that looks for a certain protein sequence. This is not a diagnostic test of any infectious disease that is used in medicine. It is a completely invalid test. 
The test cannot distinguish between a living virus and a fragment of a dead virus, which is why a PCR test on somebody who's had COVID can stay positive for up to three months. Because they can have a fragment of a dead virus in the back of their nose, and that little swab can pick it up, and it'll show up positive and say, oh, they've got COVID a second time. Meanwhile, it's still a piece from the old, the first time. Not only that, it cannot distinguish between viruses. Have you noticed how flu has disappeared? It comes up as a positive PCR test. Last winter, there was not one single confirmed case of flu in BC or Alberta. It disappeared. Normally, 8,000 people die of the flu in Canada every year. And they're all the frail elderly, same as COVID. But it disappeared. This PCR test, if, and, and by the way, a PCR test that is done on someone who has no symptoms is 97% false positive. So these PCR tests are used to drive this narrative of fear. All the government has to do to have more cases to terrify everyone with is just to do more PCR tests. It's a completely invalid test. But yet the World Health Organization designated it as the gold standard for every country in the world for identifying COVID, knowing th that it is an invalid test. The inventor of the test had said that it should not be used for diagnosing infectious diseases, and he was absolutely correct. The second question is, why have this, as these vaccines not been subjected to the same scrutiny as other vaccines? Hey, Tom, can you leave them in, in animated suspense? Because we have Dr. Rachel. Oh, Hillary okay, okay. To say hello. Okay. Do you ever ask the question? <laughs> you want to answer Do I need first? to go inside? <laughs> no, you can hang out here for a few minutes okay. until Maltels comes out. Okay, right? We're okay. trying to get you at least all. Yep, and then yeah. we'll come back to that question. Okay, okay. okay. All right. Keisha, can I answer? Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. Dr. Hoff will be back to answer your questions, but I've snagged Dr. Rachel Maurice to come and say hi to you in just a few words. But then I have to whip her back inside because there's all kinds of questions and answers going there. But I do want you to get to know this amazing, amazing and courageous doctor. Please give her a warm welcome. I don't know if I'm gonna stand up here like Dr. Hoff. <laughs> so my name is Rachel Maurice. I'm an anesthesiologist and I've been practicing for uh, almost 20 years and 16 of those have been in Kamloops at the Royal Inland Hospital. Um, I could kind of go into details about what's been going on over the last year and a half there, and I'm not gonna do that. Um, I am gonna talk about my experience uh, a little bit with my kids. Um, I have two kids, 14 and 16, and um, I, at the beginning of all of this, I was questioning things. I've always been someone who questions, and so I just, wanted to see how things were gonna pan out. Of course, I was frightened, you know, we were seeing what's going on in the world, couldn't get away from it, and everyone in the hospital was terrified, and being an anesthesiologist, kind of on the front lines, putting breathing tubes in, taking them out, and your face is right in other people's faces, and um, I was scared, but, uh, you know, that's my job. I spent my life kind of in school tr training to do that. So that's what I was gonna do. Uh, as time went on, things, it, it kind of seemed like, it seemed to bypass Kamloops or something. Um, wasn't, wasn't kind of panning out the way we were looking and I kind of breathed a sigh of relief and started you know, talking with colleagues across the country and in other parts of the world that I knew and it seemed like it was hit and miss. Um, I didn't think that a vaccine was gonna come as quickly as it did, knowing that, or hearing that, you know, five years is a fast track to a vaccine. So I thought, oh, we got a good five years to wait, and then boom, it's there. Um, 
What really kind of struck me was when, in May and June, when they were, uh, they authorized it for the 12 years and older children to go and get the shots. Um, and at that time, I didn't even realize the Infants Act was only in BC and that it actually applied to the vaccines as well. So that uh, terrified me a little bit. And I started talking with my kids. I've always talked with them openly about uh, my opinions, even though they are contrary to most of the most of my colleagues in the hospital anyways that I knew of. Um, they knew where I stood and they uh, trusted me um, and were happy to, no, none of their friends, nobody kind of bugged them about, they didn't, kids didn't seem to talk about the vaccines at all. It was, all, it was the parents and, and any kid that did it came from the household. Um, but their friends seemed to be getting shots and then, um, long story short, uh, my kids, go back and forth between myself and their dads and they went and got it when they were at their dads and I was devastated um, I felt like the only thing that I needed to do in this life was to protect my children and I couldn't even do that um, I was looking for uh, support in friends and even you know all the groups that that are on the chats, signal groups, and telegram, and so on. And um, somebody uh, writ wrote, had written something in one of the chats that I just happened to have read and has since become a dear friend of mine because what he had written just probably saved me. And it was, it, was about, it was about letting go, and it was also about honoring that we're all here um, for a purpose, and I am just here to love my children, however, however that is. Um, kids are gonna do what they're gonna do. Every every person's gonna do what they're gonna do, and you can only control how you respond to it. And I chose to just uh, try to show them as much love as I could while they're here, while we're together. Um, and. Tying into that, um, just so you know, this is this is a huge step for me standing in public talking. Um, I'm not a public speaker. I don't. You are. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was also a last minute request from uh, Dr. Hoff and Dr. Malthouse because Dr. Nagasi wasn't here, and they they asked if I could step in, and so it was a bit. It was a bit terrifying for me to do that. Uh, I wasn't quite sure if I was ready to speak publicly. Everyone that knows me knew where I stood on things, but I didn't necessarily um, stand with a microphone and talk about it. Uh, so I, it was yesterday morning, because it was last night, was the um, first night that I spoke in Kelowna. And uh, I do, I meditate every morning. Um, which is something that you don't, you're not taught in medical school, but anyways. <laughs> um, I was asking for guidance as to helping and make a decision whether this was the time for me to speak out. And um, what ended up coming to me was uh, if I, I asked myself, if I, didn't, if I didn't do this, where would that decision be coming from? And the answer was that it would be coming from fear. And we have so much fear going on in this world. It's just accelerated now. Um, and I asked myself, if I did go and do this, where would that decision be coming from? And the answer was, it would be coming from my heart. So that gave me the answer right there. And I know I've always, I've always believed in myself. Um, and... Sometimes it just it takes a lot to dig down deep to um, step out and be be public about your convictions, especially when it goes against um, culture and especially your job, your career, and all your colleagues. Um, but if I can just impart to anybody out there to, you know, if I can give some inspiration to help anyone else have the courage to even just go out and and model the courage. So that's something that I, I feel that at, at some point um, my kids will see that. Uh, it's a very powerful tool. It's probably the most powerful parenting tool 
ever. Cause, and we can see that with all the subliminal messaging going on and you know people walking around with masks and oh, I better put a mask on, I better put a mask on. You, you see, you tend to do what you see. Um, and kids don't realize, realize that as much, but um, I am here for my kids and for all the other kids because really that is where the world, but that's what's creating the world is, is our children. They are going to be our world. Um, yeah, I don't know. Thank you. What Thank else? You. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. So I am pleased to present one of my dear friends all the way from Alberta, respiratory specialist. So that means mask expert. But if you ask Chris Schaefer, they're not called masks, they're called breathing barriers. So Chris Schaefer, come on up. Thank you so much for traveling here today. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Just got a couple things I want to say to you. Um, I've, been, I've been speaking out uh, publicly, uh, nationally as well as internationally on the harm of wearing breathing barriers, which is a closed cover. So if people wear a closed cover over mouth and nose, which means that they're inhaling and exhaling from the exact same part. That's a breathing barrier. That causes hypoxia. That causes insufficient oxygen, which is insufficient oxygen in the blood. It also causes um, hypercapnia, which is uh, excessively high toxic carbon dioxide in the body. These two together uh, can cause very serious health effects. The other thing to remember is this, is that if these breathing barriers were made of plastic, what would happen? And you know what? These things are not made of plastic, but you know what? They're still made of something that is very non-breathable. It's hard to breathe with one on. What does that tell you? It means that you're not supposed to wear them. Respirators and masks are designed for breathing. They're designed to be comfortable so you can breathe effortlessly. If you have, if you have something on your face that's causing you to breathe more strenuously because it's on your face, then you should take it off. That is a breathing blocker. So in conclusion, I have a, uh, I, I, I wrote a second letter to uh, Dr. Hinshaw, which is from Alberta, uh, Bonnie Henry and here in BC, and all the uh, uh, medical directors of every province in the country. They got this letter right here. I created a brochure of it because it's so heavily censored online. Please come see me. I've only got a very limited amount today. Um, so if you haven't seen this yet, please grab one. My contact information is on the back, and you can also look for it online, and it, you can get it. It's translated to multiple languages and it's available all around the world. Thank you. There's so many cameras up here, it's making me a little nervous. You know, um, I'm Dr. Stephen Malthouse. I'm a family doctor from, uh, from uh, Denman Island. I've been in practice for 43 years here in British Columbia. And you know, way at the beginning of this, uh, many of us doctors uh, were very worried about what was coming our way. We thought that there was a pandemic, uh, a tsunami of death and destruction that was coming this way. And so we all prepared to do extra time to go back to the hospitals and so forth. But when we actually looked at the statistics, we found that there really was no pandemic, that the all-cause mortality in, in, in Canada was no different from the previous years. So some of us are starting to wonder what was going on. We were scratching our heads. Then we saw that the deaths in Canada, for example, in British Columbia, we had zero deaths up to early part of this year in children or in people under the age of 20. No deaths from COVID. We saw 14 or 15 in all of Canada that died with a positive PCR test. And many of you know the PCR tests are really fraudulent, right? Because of the number of cycles they do, the cycle threshold, they crank it up to 35 to 45. It means just about anybody who has something coming out of the nose is going to test positive. Or even if you don't have something out of your nose, the whole idea was creating asymptomatic patients who actually didn't have disease, but then could be locked away, put behind masks, and told to distance from their fellow man. But when we saw that this was coming out to go after the kids 5 to 11 years old, that's when we felt that we needed to get on the road and come and see you face to face, eye to eye, and to tell you some of the things that you will need, not just for you, because many of you already know this information, 
at least a lot of it. But it will give you the, the enthusiasm, the boost perhaps, to go and speak to your neighbor. Because neighbors are now going to start looking over the fence. Those that wouldn't talk to you before are going to start asking questions because they're seeing people die. More people have died from COVID vaccine than have died from COVID itself. When we take the PCR test out of the sort of the equation, we find that the numbers of 400,000 have already dropped down to 35,000 in the United States. People were incentivized to put COVID on the death certificates for hospitals to get their doctors to do it and also not to treat people in early disease with ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, things which around the world have been used to treat hundreds of thousands of patients successfully. Where do we get Good question. We'll ask her that later. But, but you know, the problem is that as doctors, we were not allowed to prescribe those. We were discouraged. And in fact, uh, uh, Dr. Nagase, who couldn't be here tonight, who prescribed ivermectin for two patients in the, from the emergency department, actually when he was working there and covering the hospital, to two elderly patients in their 70s who had COVID, who were actually getting sicker and not doing well. When he prescribed ivermectin, and those patients got up and started walking the wards, he had all his jobs in Alberta canceled on him. He was removed from his job, from his emergency room position. And when the doctor came and replaced him, that doctor took away all the medicines. So when we saw this coming out for the five to 11 year olds, we had to ask ourselves, why? And there's some questions you have to ask. First of all, is COVID dangerous to small children? Is it dangerous to children under kids under 20 and it's not in Canada we had 14 deaths recorded with it but reality they all had severe comorbidities the death rate for this is zero in Sweden they looked at 2 million children and they found that the number that died from COVID zero in Germany they looked at three large studies looking at their population and the number of deaths from COVID in that group zero so are children not at risk you know three quarters of kids don't even have symptoms when they get COVID? The severity of COVID in ICU admissions is 0.2 per 10,000. They couldn't find enough kids to actually make up a death, a death number because they didn't have any kids that were dying. And yet we're going after these kids with a shot which has lots of danger. The other question we have to ask ourselves is if we, kids, if we give these kids a shot, will it prevent them from infecting grandma or grandpa or their teacher or their parents? And the answer to that is no. There's no need for a shot for that because kids do not pass up the COVID disease to adults. The safest place to be if you're an adult is a teacher in a kindergarten. In Sweden, they did a large study showing that the ICU admissions, if you were a teacher, were the least of any profession because they're hanging around with kids who never pass it to them, who rarely pass it to other children. Our children are not in danger. But if we go after them with something which is, then the risk-benefit ratio is not acceptable. The other question you might ask is, do children, when they get COVID, does it give them any lingering problems? And it doesn't. Unlike adults, they do not have lung inflammation that goes on and on and on. These kids recover completely. And then we have things which can treat them. Do you know that if we gave ivermectin, if we had given ivermectin to people in the United States, 80% of the deaths would have been prevented. 80%. Every study in ivermectin showed that it was effective. 100% of, of the studies of ivermectin showed that to varying degrees, ivermectin stopped COVID disease. So, we have early treatment if we need it. Here comes a big question. Why didn't public health tell you about this? Why are they gonna go after your kids? And you know, they're gonna take it right down to six months. You know that, right? It's already in the works. Pfizer's doing the studies. They're ready. So the question comes up in the end is why? Now let me ask you something. How many people here, well, I'm sure Dr. Dr. Hoff might have talked to you about what he saw in his practice. Did he do that? Yeah. And how the spike protein is a very dangerous thing? Yeah. Because, you know, the vaccine was created, was designed 
to infiltrate your cells, hijack the mechanism, and cause the creation of artificial spike proteins that look, as far as I can tell, like the ones on the coronavirus. Some problems there, right? There's no off switch. Your body is made into a factory creating spike proteins. And those spike proteins are inflammatory and you know they go all over the place, right? He must have told you about that. The mouse study, they found that they actually went to every part of the mice, including the ovaries and the testes. Did he ask you if you guys wanted to volunteer sperm testing? Of course, you have to have your test before and after the shot, so it's hard to get volunteers for that one. But there's this issue here of infertility, right? That if our kids get those shots, it's very plausible, because they didn't do animal studies, right, beforehand, so we don't really know. But it's very plausible, based on the inflammation caused by spike proteins, that our children will become infertile. Now, in those vials, we don't know. They all seem to be different. Some do have just saline in them, which is placebo, right? And some have mRNA in it to create the spike proteins, and some have nanotechnology in them. We have confirmation from four individual labs that nanotechnology is in those shots, but not all of them. In the United States, 5% of the lots, that's pretty much 5% of the shots, are responsible for 100% of the deaths that were reported to VAERS, and 100% of the adverse events. It means 5% of the shots did all the damage. Those are what were called the kill shots. But that doesn't mean if you get one of the 95 other ones that you haven't got something. It's just that we don't know what it is. And some people may have placebo. Probably our prime minister. No, I think he had a retractable syringe. So I'm going to let uh, Dr. Malthouse here continue, but I just want to remind everybody not to go quite yet because we're hearing all this doom and gloom. We're hearing all of the bad things that are happening, but we have some solutions coming up and we have some really exciting news coming up for these solutions. So def definitely stick around and give us a minute here, but let's go ahead and hear some more uh, facts and stats from the doctors. We appreciate you so much, by the way. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, think my, I don't think my job is to frighten you because we've all had enough fear. I think my, my job is really to inform you so we can use caution, which is different from fear. It's using our intellect and our emotions our, uh, to create understanding of what is going on around us because that's the only place we can start from, right? And then we need to not just get ourselves stuck in understanding that we're in a kind of a difficult situation and that the predators are coming after our children, but we have to have solutions. And one of those solutions, the first one, of course, is for you to become informed. Second one is for you to inform others. And the other one is to unite. And that is the important thing, that we have power in us. Like, we're the people that are actually those that stand up and say no more. That makes one of us worth 10,000 people who comply because they're, they're not willing to make a wave. Right? But to do that, to create the power, it's going to require unity. And although we send half the people are out here and half the people are in there, the way that the enemy always divides to win is divide and conquer. So I know Dr. Hoff told you about these shots and how dangerous they can become. You may have also discussed the idea of shedding. Did you talk about that or transmission? This is a phenomenon which has been well, well, um, well recorded of people that get symptoms after they've been exposed to someone who was recently given the shot. We don't know what that is. It could be that spike proteins are emitted from certain people uh, through their perspiration or through their breath, and that you take them up and you feel sick. 
But since we know there's nanotechnology in there, there's also the possibility of something like radiation sickness, that you're actually connecting to that person in some way and getting some, some kind of a, like an electromagnetic energy that's disturbing your system and making you sick. So we don't really know. Thank you, doctor, for having the courage for everything that you're doing um, on behalf of all people. Uh, my question was going to be, it's already been asked, but I was wondering what is your opinion if this is happening on a global level and people are not listening to what the doctors and scientists are happening, what is your opinion on what the true agenda behind this? And is this, um, is, is this a bioweapons attack on humanity? Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to get that by default. I know Chris, I, Chris and I have had lots of talks over the dinner table about what is going on here, but we... we oh. You can see we're, we're trying to get rid of the hot potato here. But let's look at what's happening. I mean, this has nothing to do with your health. It's nothing to do with a virus, really. Although the virus may or may not have been created in Wuhan in the lab. Um, you know, it, 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 it definitely, a lot of doctors have said it's a bioweapon, and it's certainly not beneficial to you. I mean, uh, I mean, they've created this artificial thing, now they've created the, the cure for it, which is almost equally or more dangerous, right? So let's face it, there's some other agenda going on here. And that's where many of you have already been down those rabbit holes to try to figure it out. It can go anywhere from a change of our financial system, and that's why we encourage people to use cash. Maybe you know of uh, uh, Captain Austin Fitz and yeah. Cash Friday. Because yeah. as long as we can keep cash going, all right, we'll be able to prevent the shift towards a cryptocurrency that is controlled centrally, which with a flick of a switch can stop your bank account. That's the plan. But there are many other things. The Great Reset, that's what it's all about. And beyond the Great Reset, we ask ourselves, is there some spiritual battle going on here too? Which I would say, yes, I think there is. And that's where we have to also get into the field and fight back spiritually. And to do that, that means we have to actually work on our own spiritual development. And that will give us protection, but also make us into real warriors. Okay. Uh -oh. Good evening. Um, my wife has stage four uh, cancer. And... Uh, from what we've understood, it's the risk is not worth it uh, for having a shot. But also, even catching a cold can be bad for her because why well, shouldn't fake my cancer? Right? So we're wondering what what is available for treatment to keep her out of the hospital or myself, even. And uh, like, I, and also including, um, I found it by accident. Uh, I was looking up colloidal silver and COVID. And it came across the site, the NIH slash government site, and you read the first and the last paragraph, and it basically says colloidal silver is, you know, it'll, it'll keep you from catching COVID. And I'm thinking, well, I know it's not expensive, so maybe that's why they don't want you to know about this, but do you know anything about that as well? Because it's readily available, and according to the NIH, NIH, NIH site, it's a uh, uh, COVID inhibitor which I've never heard of before that, and, uh, but and anyway, we're looking for the, 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 um, the treatments to keep out of the hospital that are, that are available, you know, that they haven't stopped us from getting. So I can't comment on the effectiveness of colloidal silver. I, I haven't seen the research on it. I, I know it's, it is a wonderful treatment for many things, but I, I can't comment on it specifically with regard to COVID. But um, it, it, is, it is absolutely not true what the medical health authorities are telling us is that there is no treatment for COVID outside of the, outside of the hospital. The, the single most effective treatment for COVID is ivermectin. Ivermectin was discovered back in the 1970s. It is a gift from nature. It is, it is a, a naturally occurring substance that is found in soil. It was discovered in soil in a golf course in Japan in 1975. It is made by a soil organism. The commercially available ivermectin is now synthetically produced. They have worked out the structure of the molecule, so they're no longer having to get it out of soil. 
but it is literally one of the safest medications known to man. It has been used all over the world for almost 40 years in people. It is also used in livestock, just as many, many other medications that are used on people are also used on horses and dogs and all sorts of different creatures. If there has been enormous misinformation about ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine and numerous other COVID treatments. And many people have asked, why have the authorities put out so much misinformation about these effective and very safe treatments? And the simple answer is that for the authorities to mandate or to even recommend the use of an experimental product that is not approved by Health Canada, there has to be a very dangerous emergency for which there is no other treatment. And so the reason why they will not acknowledge the effectiveness of ivermectin or of hydroxychloroquine is because if they acknowledged how safe and effective they were, they wouldn't be able to roll out the vaccines. It would be against the law. So just follow the money. Yeah. Yeah. So ivermectin, um, ivermectin needs to be combined with vitamin D and vitamin C and zinc and casein. The best website to look all this stuff up that I'm aware of is the FLCCC. That's the Frontline COVID Critical Care Alliance in the United States, um, where you can see a whole protocol for, out, for early outpatient treatment of COVID-19. And there are other websites with, with other information. There are now 62 scientific studies showing the effectiveness of ivermectin. There are more than 250 showing the effectiveness of hydroxychloroquine. They are both very safe and very effective. But doctors are not allowed to prescribe ivermectin anymore. So unfortunately, the medical health authorities are forcing Canadians to use veterinary products, which is very unfortunate. But that is what they have driven us to. Did you want to add anything? <laughs> I wanted to ask this big tall guy in the back if he's got anything to say. Because he's kind of quiet, huh? I wonder if, if wearing those... Um, those breathing barriers has any effect for keeping you out of hospital. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And you know what? I just want to say, it's so nice to, to see you take it off. So thank you. You know, I, I don't, it's, it's a long story, but if she didn't have cancer or not. But you know what? It'll only, it can only be, it can only increase cancer. It can't, it can't help, it can't defend against cancer. That's it right. can only make it worse. Back to that NIH, I believe said if you spray colloidal silver on your mask, that's a great inhibitor too. But well, first of all, they're not masks, they're breathing barriers. Oh, yeah, 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 I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, know. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to wear one for any length of time for sure, because I don't want the oxygen in the yeah. So, uh, yeah, I know, it's, 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 yeah. But the easy way to tell whether it's an actual uh, respirator mask or a breathing barrier is the breathing barrier, you're inhaling and exhaling from the same place. In yeah. an actual respirator, there's valves for inhalation and exhalation separate systems, so you don't re-inhale your exhale there. So if you re-inhale your exhale there, you're wearing a breathing barrier. Yeah. yeah. I mean, normally I'm the rebel. If everybody was wearing a, rat, a mask, I would be the one to not be, yeah, just always a black so you're shirt. Gonna wear them. Them. Now it's all yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, thanks. That's a good one. And you know, they also did. They also looked at um, at masks. They cultured. They found all sorts of organisms in those masks after a few hours of kids wearing them in school. I mean, they're creating a petri dish in front of their faces, and that does not make sense. Plus, it doesn't make sense for other people around them because you're expelling the aerosolizing material in the mask. It's going everywhere. So you know. Not good. But also the thing is this, is not wearing a mask is also important because you're, I think it's because you're modeling freedom. You're modeling non-compliance with something which is absurd. I uh, came up in a conversation today at the coffee shop. But, um, uh, questions about blood banks, which is like if you needed a blood transfusion, can somebody that's vaccinated that's donated blood take your blood for an unvaccinated person? Uh, and just a quick question of what ivermectin is, Corona ivermectin safe to take? 
They're the same the strength. They're usually 10 milligrams, uh, 10 milligrams per mil, and you just make sure you get the right amount. Otherwise, you will, well, you'll, you'll grow a tail. I know. The reality is that I'll never ever do anything like that for the next five years. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yes. cool. You know, now I couldn't say that as a doctor, right? I couldn't prescribe, uh, you know, horse ivermectin, but I've heard a lot of people using it. I've heard Dr. Hoff has a history of using horse ivermectin. <laughs> Of course, you have to give them a roll of pay every morning now. I'll <laughs> just throw this roll of pay on, on the website. Oh, the blood bank question. Yeah, uh, Canada Health, uh, uh, Canada Blood Services does not differentiate vax un and vax free blood. So if you go there and you're vax free, uh, you don't know whose blood you're going to get. So there's no differentiation there. And we were suggesting that would be a good business for somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's blood. <laughs> Are you volunteering or something like that? Yeah, so that's a great that's a good question. In Japan they do actually differentiate between the vax and the vax free. Um, but not in Canada. If you know Del Bigtree who had a bleeding issue and he had to go to Mexico to get to get a transfusion. Yeah. Next question please. Hi. Um, you were saying that children can't give it it can't go up the line. Well, in July or August, they closed down a whole preschool in Lake Country because COVID outbreak. And um, my girlfriend's grand granddaughter was there, and she stayed the night with her when she was really sick. And my girlfriend got COVID, and then I was visiting two days later and spent two days, and I got COVID. Uh, so my question is, how, how can I make a statement like that? Okay. Huh? Embrace it. Embrace no, it. no, I think your question, I <laughs> no, your, no, no, your question, my question is, your question is a very children. good one. Yeah, yes, thank because, you. because I stated earlier that children do not pass COVID up right. to adults, right? right? It only comes downward, yes. which is what we know. But the thing is, the diagnosis of COVID is very difficult, yeah. right? They okay. don't know where the co COVID and the flu have very similar characteristics. And okay. we know the flu can be passed all around in every different direction. Right. So the diagnosis of COVID is the challenge. Okay. And we're using the PCR test, which is, yeah. gives so many false positives, usually with 35 to 45 repetitions, amplifications, CT, yeah. that you have at least 90%, 97% according to the, uh, the Portugal courts, right. um, false positives. So it's very hard to know what you actually have. So that's the only way I can answer that question okay. based on your, what you've experienced. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if a new mother gets vaccinated, is there an effect in the breast milk? Does it, does, does, do we know? <laughs> the answer to that is yes. That spike proteins can go across through breast milk and there have been some uh, children that have died in the United States from uh, enterocolitis, inflammation of the bowel uh, when breastfeeding. And thought to be caused by that. And that could be accessed on the internet or...? Yeah, you'll be able to find the information there. Okay. I can't offhand tell you exactly where. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and it's not a lot of kids, but enough to know that there's... And the other thing is, many things don't come to, the, to light, and uh, they don't get... People don't put two and two together. A lot of people have a severe vax, uh, COVAX uh, side effect, often go back and get the second one, yeah. because they're kind of... They, they don't want to believe that the other one, that the shot. Because people want safety so badly, that they will go to something which is an illusion, which is dangerous, illusion of safety, and dangerous to them, and they don't want to give up that that sense of safety because they're so frightened. Next question, please. Um, just talking about ivermectin, since so many of us are trying to look for alternative places to get it, is there any that um, you would warn against, or anything like you said, looking for just pure? Um, but is there any other warning signs of what to look for for a good option for ivermectin versus any that you should avoid? Uh, there is some ivermectin which has another uh, parasite ingredient in it. Yeah, I'm going to pass it on to Hoff to answer this one. So, so some of the agricultural as, um, um, ivermectin has another antiparasitic called praziquantel in it. 
So paracetamol is also used in, in, for treating people. It's not toxic to us. Where I did my medical training in South Africa, we used it frequently for treating a disease called bilharzia, which was a parasite um, in the bowel and the bladder that caused blood in the urine. In fact, I had in my final medical exams, I got a patient with bilharzia to, uh, that I had to diagnose. Um, so, so even so, but it, that's not so. It, it's not harmful to people, but it's of no benefit. You don't need it. So you need to rather try and find the one that is just ivermectin. Okay. Thank you. Next question, please. Well, I, I actually, when we first started looking at uh, equine agrovermectin, I called the poison control to see if it was safe or not, and uh, they had no reports of adverse events. So I can't speak for the whole world, but it's such a very safe medicine. I think they've been using it for such, for a long time. How many years have they used ivermectin? 60, 40 to 60 years? Early 80s, okay. 40 years. What about the dosing? The dosing? And the dose is the same. No, 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 but you don't want to take the whole two. That would not be good. And um, unless you weigh the same as a horse. But it is 10 milligrams per mil. It's the same for humans in terms of the number of milligrams you would take as a case. So you might be a smaller, rather than a tablet that says 12 milligrams on it, you may, may take 1.2 mils. Okay. So it's, it's a small amount. Yeah, the, the dose, um, the, the normal dose is 0 0.4 milligrams per kilogram per day, unless you're very sick, in which case you should take 0 0.6 milligrams per kilogram per day, per day. But normally you wouldn't take that for more than five days. And if you're still sick and you need it for longer, you need to reduce the dose, otherwise it's going to accumulate in your body because it has a, very, a long half-life and it's very slowly metabolized. So, so for ivermectin, if you're going to take it for more than five days, you need to reduce the dose to about one third if you're going to take it for a longer time. Can you, should you introduce probiotics while you're taking it? Not necessary. Okay. I wouldn't argue with that. <laughs> Dr. Hoff and I get into these, these uh, debates about different things. We, we uncover stuff that the other person didn't know. We say something and then we go. But you know, I imagine so say, how long would it take you taking a dose of 0.4 milligram per kilogram to actually have any evidence of toxicity? It's so safe. You probably have to go for weeks and weeks and weeks, right? So it, I don't know whether it's absolutely necessary to reduce the dose. And, it, and if you own a pharmacy, it reduces your income. <laughs> It has an enormous margin of safety. I have a patient that took 15 times the dose accidentally and they were so impressed at how well it worked. <laughs> One mark for Dr. Walthouse. <laughs> Next question, please. I guess I'm the last question. Oh no, we've got some more here. It concerns Moderna and specifically whether or not that vaccine causes inflammation and specifically in the back. And there's a, a, a case that I know of, and uh, I'm just wondering if you're getting any reports of inflammation caused by that vaccine in particular. Yeah, so in, inflammation is a sort of a non-specific thing. Um, it, it certainly causes pain. Um, so pain is usually a sign of inflammation. Um, the neurological injuries that I've seen in my own patients are frequently accompanied by pain. Um, I, I, have, uh, I have patients that have chronic headaches ever since having their, um, their uh, Moderna shot. I have, um, I'm trying to think what other pain syndromes I have. Um, I, had, I had a patient who had a painful Bell's palsy. So Bell's palsy is a paralysis of half the face. And this person... Um, got a Bell's palsy first on one side of her face, which was painful, which is quite unusual, and then a month later got a Bell's palsy on the other side of her face. So, um, so it certainly, it, so, but, but, but a neurological pain um, may not specifically be inflammation. I suspect it's the micro blood clots, but this is an experiment. I mean, we don't really know yet, um, but it certainly can cause pain. The chronic, the, the, the commonest pain that I've heard of is chronic headaches, but I do have two patients who have chronically painful feet, underneath their feet, and they say it hurts to walk. Next question, please. OK, 
Okay, my doctor told me that I might benefit from this vaccine because I have idiothrombotopenia. I have not gone back to him since. <laughs> but is your uh, opinion on that? Like my platelets run between 20 and 40. So this is someone who has a very low platelet count, which normally in platelets 150 to 300. Yes. Can be up to 450 and, and be considered normal. Uh, so he has a low platelet count, which means he has a tendency to bleeding, right? But we also know that there's, there's some of the uh, COVID itself does have a, sometimes will interfere with, with, um, with your platelets. Plus we've seen some ex extraordinary bleeding after the shot. So it, it sounds like, again, a bit of a Russian roulette for you to take it. And you've got a problem with obviously with bleeding or with clotting already. And as Dr. Hoff has said, this is maybe considered a clot shot in many people. So it, it wouldn't make sense for you to take it. The other thing is, if it doesn't benefit anybody, why, why would you take it? <laughs> right? Okay. So tell your doctor we told him that. <laughs> Hi. Um, my question, I apologize if I if somebody else has asked this, I've been outside so I don't know. But if if I think I've had COVID and I want to get an antibody test, but I need a doctor to sign off on it and you can't find one of those, do you give any credence to that testing and is it like would it help to not have to take a shot? Why do you want to take the antibody test? To find out if I've actually had it. And what are you going to do if you found out you had it? That's what I want to know. Is it, would, it, would it help with anything? Like, could you show that to... No? That's the problem. It's not accepted by most of the authorities. Usually it means a PCR test or evidence that you've been double vaxxed. Okay. Thanks. So what it means there is, though they do have tests, some of them are less reliable than others. You know, you have to think of the end point. Why would you do it? out of curiosity or because it can be used to get you on an airplane or to get you to see your family in the hospital or something like that, right? So, so far it doesn't seem to have much value except know that, you, that you've had it. Most people know when they've had it. Yeah. yeah. Sorry if I sound a little uh, redundant. The five days on ivermectin, if you don't mind me going back to that. To that question. Is it for, for preventative measure or is it to treat COVID? Ivermectin is the perfect medication for COVID because you can use it, for, it works by, it blocks the spike protein on the virus and it blocks the ACE2 receptors in your upper airways so it literally stops the virus from being able to get into your cells where it will replicate. So it will prevent you from getting COVID if you have been exposed and it will treat, it'll treat you if you're infected by literally not letting the virus, that's how it works as an antiviral, by not letting it get into your cells. But it also works as an anti-inflammatory through five different pathways. So even later on in the, in the, in the COVID infection, after the, 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 the viral phase of rapid replication is over and there's just inflammation, it'll still work then. It even works for post-COVID syndrome and it helps vaccine injuries, probably again by binding spike proteins. So, and, and by its anti-inflammatory effect. So ivermectin is useful in every phase. Thank you for that. And after the five days, is that one question how frequent? Or two? <laughs> I think Dr. Hoff was going to say that, that the schedules that you would use for prevention or for treatment would be different. The five days in a row schedule would be if you're actually sick with COVID. Prevention might be once a week. Thank you. <laughs> and just one more thing. Ivermectin is a really unusual drug. In a Slovakia study, they showed that uh, nanotechnology, which came from nasal swabs for the PCR test, was dissolved by ivermectin. And also, the saliva of people who recover from COVID. Wow. Hey there. Um, I was outside, so I'm not sure if this was talked about or not, but uh, in that court case, I had heard that they, the court case had got thrown out because no one had actually um, isolated COVID-19. Is that uh, plausible? Well, COVID-19 is the disease itself, but you're probably talking about the causative agent, the virus, which is SARS-CoV-2. And there's a question of whether they'd actually isolated this or not. Um, and there's, uh, and among scientists, or whether they've actually got the genomic formula to be able to, you know, replicate it, create a, another one. But um, 
Among scientists that I know a lot around the world, they're 50-50 divided. Mm -hmm. Some of them think that they do have it, some of them they don't have it. Some are following Cox postures that it was never isolated properly without making a, you know, TL. It's a bit like, you know, having a cup of coffee and saying, I've isolated caffeine, you know, it's not, it, 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 to find the, actually the single thing is quite difficult without adding all these other things in there. So, to answer your question, we don't really know. So if, they, if we don't know if we've had it isolated, how can we test people for it? Very good question. When they, when they did a PCR test, good question. When they did the PCR test in the United States, they used a substitute as the matching thing that they called the SARS-CoV-2. And in fact, when you look at the CDC stuff for the emergency use authorization of PCR tests, it says, well, we didn't have any SARS-CoV-2 authentic stuff around, so we used a substitute. So it's a fraud? I can't really say that. I just say they didn't have it. <laughs> they didn't have it. <laughs> I feel like I'm in the court of law here. No. <laughs> It just means they didn't have it handy when they made the PCR test, which they used throughout the United States. You know, jump to your own conclusions. I'm just going to just further an answer to that question. Um, yeah, you can say, how can we make a vaccine if you don't even know what the, if, if nobody's actually isolated it? Well, the, the, the genome sequence for COVID-19 was released by the Chinese onto the internet on the 10th of December, sorry, 10th of January, 2020. And the World Health Organization told scientists around the world and laboratories to not to try to isolate or culture this virus, just use the sequence that had been given out on the internet. And so that's what they used. So it's all a bit of a mystery uh, um, to me. So anyway, in case that helps. <laughs> oh, another question. Hi. Um, thank you, doctors, for giving your time. It's commendable. A uh, question I have is on blood clots. I have a personal experience in my family um, and the doctor is um, basically saying it's a coincidence. It was a, a blood clot to the lung. Very, very lucky that my husband survived. He does not believe that the shot could cause this and his doctor continues to say that Pfizer and Moderna have absolutely no proof of blood clotting. So, can you please enlighten me as I, I totally believe this is what happened to him and it seems like this is local doctors from Salmon Arm who have told me that I'm, I'm clearly out to lunch. Yeah, sadly we hear this story frequently. The evidence of clotting as I mentioned, I had done this D-dimer test on my patients who were not vaccine injured and found that more than 15% had this elevated D-dimer test after their shot. Now, 50, sorry, did I say 15? 50, more than 50%. So, other, since I sort of made that known, other doctors have been doing the same test and they had been doing it before. But they, initially they didn't know how to interpret it. They didn't, hadn't sort of, didn't seem to have thought about the micro-clot idea. But they knew that vaccine-injured people had a, an elevated D-dimer and they'd be doing scans to try and find the clots and often not find them. So other emergency room doctors um, have been doing D-dimer tests on vaccine-injured people and found massive, massively high D-dimer levels. So, and again, you won't necessarily... Now, if it's a large blood clot, you'll see it on a scan. If it's microscopic blood clots, you will not see it on the scan. But the D-dimer the test is the evidence of clotting. Okay, so second question. <clears throat> if, in fact, um, we have went back to the doctor, they're trying to do studies to find out what has happened to my husband because he's a very healthy person, very active man. It, there was no need for this. Um, they're stating that he should continue to take, continue to take the shots. Um, and I have asked about the D-dimer tests, which is how the actual clot was found. Um, but the doctor is saying that there's no need because it, it's not necessary. So um, <laughs> I've tried the you know, on conversations with the doctor. Um, so that we could run more tests to see there maybe there is other blood clotting I don't know um, do you can you say is a recommendation once you're on blood thinners um, 
is that your safety or how should you continue to be checked since you once you've had blood clots? Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Firstly, the benefit from these vaccines is so minimal because we know that the very limited immunity that you get fades out after a few months. So there's, there is almost no benefit to them at all. It's all just risk because it's not just about two shots. This is going to be at least three a year indefinitely until you say no more. So, you know, if this, if this was about actually making a person immune to COVID and actually protecting them and protecting others, then there would be a good argument for it. But it doesn't protect them and it doesn't protect others and there's clear evidence of harm. So I don't think these shots are for anybody. There are safe and effective treatments for COVID that will treat every strain of COVID, every variant, these, these shots were designed for the original coronavirus that doesn't exist anymore. It is mutated into different variants and it doesn't work. It's useless for the Delta variant and even more useless for Omicron. So there's literally no benefit and all risk. How long does the virus last? Normally. Like the Delta virus yeah, that's a good question. It's about viruses. What do they do? Normally, the, the first time a virus, well, we have, we're wondering what a, real, a virus really is. You know, we don't know whether it's actually an enemy that we have to defend ourselves against or whether it's an upgrade of our kind of computer system. That's another question. What is a virus really? But typically, viral illnesses last, you know, maybe 7, 10, sometimes 30 days, you know, with the, sequ the sort of recovery period, stuff like that. And it's the same. Now, of course, if people are, get COVID, it depends on how sick they get to how long they last. The viral stage where you actually have virus around usually lasts about 10 to 14 days. Then the virus is gone. But it's the inflammatory condition that comes next, and then the coagulation, the clotting that comes. But I'm sorry, we have people over here asking questions first. If you want to get to the end of the line, you just have to go down the block and then just get it in there. <laughs> okay. Um, Yes, yeah, so the question of that woman about whether she should have a shot, her husband should have a second shot, uh, with what Dr. Hoff said, in other words, no benefit and all risk, plus evidence that the person's already had, probably, based on the, the, the timing, the temporal relationship to having the shot, they sound like the person's at high risk for an injury, and I, if it was me, I would certainly not have the second shot. Thank you for your time coming to talk to us. Um, my question is, um, is losing your sense of taste and smell one of the symptoms of COVID? <laughs> yes, it is, but it's not just COVID because it was also noted with influenza. And, and so it's often, sometimes people think it's a due, an, an evidence of a zinc deficiency. Another good reason to make sure you take lots of zinc. Um, so it's not a differentiating Characteristic. Now, if you lose your you lose your sense of smell and reduce taste, we have seen that go. But we're looking very carefully, right? When this all came out, we were looking for blue toes and loss of sense of smell and all these other things. Whereas these may have occurred, but we have never paid much attention to them before. Third question. Okay. If um, for, for, for instance, if there is viral shedding taking place. And for the people who have taken the shot, is there anything you can recommend to have the spike proteins leave your body? So that's a, that's a good question about whether you can actually clear spike proteins out. And um, I'm going to let Dr. Hoff answer this one a little bit. But there are some good references, including the uh, World uh, Council for Health, where they talk about people who have injuries from COVID. COVID symptoms afterwards, adverse events, and things they can do to try to get rid of them. And so things like, you know, serum in, in pine needle tea and things like that. Anything else to add to that? Yeah, so, so um, pine needle tea, so this is a tea that you can make from the green needles. <coughs> So I just want to just tell you very briefly about the pine needle tea, but most of the stuff around it, detoxing and, uh, yeah, I think going to that website would be a good idea. But, but you can use the needles of either pine trees, fir trees, or spruce trees, 
and, and steep them in some hot water, strain them out, um, and, and uh, it, it contains the active ingredient is suramin, um, which has been used for apparently more than 100 years. Um, it it um, apparently works by helping to fracture the spikes, um, and, and so it detoxes your body in that way. There are other things too that you can find if you look at the uh, uh, World Council for Health site. But there, and we're working on it all the time to find more and more. Like we're really working on it. Whether magnetic beds work, that's a good question. You know, whether taking ivermectin afterwards is worthwhile. Uh, it, it has effects on spike proteins, and uh, yeah. So we're we're working on it constantly because there are a lot of people out there with with injuries and have regret and want to fix things that have you know, seem almost irreparable. Another question. Should we let him speak? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I've been actually hoping somebody would ask him. How can we Use the mic. <laughs> How can we actually help our children to remain as healthy as we can? I understand. I'll give my little girl, six years old, vitamins or zinc tablets. What else can we do? Is there anything else that we should be doing as parents and stuff? Keep Six know, hugs a day. That's going. definitely there. That's definitely there. Daddy gets in there. No masks. No masks. No masks. Yeah, no You're masks. all on the road and you know, and lots of love. So. Um, I think vitamin D is also useful if you're doing that, so that's really good for kids in winter. All need to take it, just base it on their weight and reduce it down, you know. It's very safe, has a huge safety margin, so in fact most people are not taking enough. So that would be worthwhile, but you know, vitamin D doesn't stand alone. You make sure you've got a good multiple vitamin, would be worthwhile. Organic food if possible, you know, avoid pesticides and all that. And, uh, in Lots, your child of yeah. Lots of playtime with dad. And there are other things too. If you find that the child seems to have a weakness in some area, I would suggest something like homeopathy or Chinese medicine. Homeopathy is very easy to take because it's, it's sweet little sugar pills under your tongue. But it's more difficult to treat. But there are lots of things you can do to try to say, uh, it's like taking your car in for a bit of a, a tune up, you know? Next question, please. What about having a kids around other vaccines? Yeah, that's, that's, that's something to be concerned about because of this, this thing that we really don't know a lot about, how it, the mechanism of which is this idea of, of uh, transmission or shedding. So I think we'll have to leave you on that one just to think that it may be something to be cautious about, particularly if they've just gone and had a big, you know, all had their shots. Are you guys seeing evidence of that? Are people sharing those stories with you? Are kids with the vaccine and people are coming back showing symptoms? We're not seeing kids because they've just brought it down to this age, right? So we haven't got a lot of evidence for that this time. No, I mean, kids were exposed to people who were vaccinated, like my sister. This is a question. So this is a question of someone who's had the shot, and then the child is exposed to them, whether they have adverse events. Is that correct? Well, I have a, a child that I saw that had a a, a fork would attach to the anterior part of the child's chest, with, just through magnetism. That child did not have a shot. No one in the family had a shot, but someone who was staying with them and would come up and have meals with them had had the shot. Wow. So the child was exhibiting magnetism. So there's transmission of something uh, in, in people, kids that are exposed. So be, keep that in mind. Just use caution. I have an experience with, uh, with that question as well. But, yes. Uh, I know my wife are now separated because of this virus or because yes. of uh, But before we separated, when we slept together, I'd have problems because of my, I think it was my arthropathopenia. I'd get problems with my, with my internal. Yes, well we have seen definitely adults who are exposed, who are on, who are vax free, who are exposed to someone who had a vaccine and we don't know, it could have been recently or it could have been some distance back, having adverse event, you know, symptoms like they, they're toxic, uh, either, I mean, we don't know the mechanism of that really. It could be spike protein, could be some kind of uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, radiation. Next question, please. Well, my question was actually about shedding as well. So, okay. Um, my husband and I are going to be trying to conceive soon, and so we've been, you know, thinking a lot about that with the shedding, um, and it's been a concern for us. Um, I was just wondering, professionally, I know that there's a lot that we don't know, but um, what would be your professional um, opinion on what would be a safe window of time, like uh, after someone's had a vaccine, to then see them. Um, do you, yeah, that's kind of my question. 
Or would you just not see anyone who's, <laughs> who's vaccinated? That's really hard. Yeah, the answer to that is we don't really know. Because when some people have had, you know, uh, they can have, uh, you know, spike proteins identified, you know, 15 months, I believe it is, after the, after the shot. And some people are more susceptible to shedding than others. Uh, we don't even know what shedding is. Transmission, I think a lot of it's due with actually transmission, electromagnetic transmission. But other people think it's due to spikes. And, uh, and it could be two mechanisms. So we really can't answer that question. But certainly if you're planning on getting pregnant or you, know, or you are pregnant or you're breastfeeding, then you should take extra cautions and stay away from people that are vaxxed. I know we've got someone up here somewhere that I know the stage who just says, you know, if you're vaxxed, you know, just stay away from me. And, uh, you know, we'll talk to you. It's heartbreaking, eh? Yes, it is. It is. But, you know, we're going to get to know more about this as we go along, okay? So we're going to try to, to unlock the, the puzzle of shedding and transmission to try to keep us as one family. So uh, there's hope. I just want to say I'm thankful that you guys are here speaking to us. I'm a homeschooling mom of four. I've had COVID three times. I know that seems unbelievable, but I have. I still don't have my taste or smell. So that's my first question. How long will, you, will I end up with COVID in order to build immunity? With the mutating of the COVID virus, will I end up with COVID again? And I'm not vaccinated, but I've, I have had COVID three times. Yeah, but well, it usually, was less each time. Less each time, yeah. <laughs> usually when you have a viral illness, uh, like, like measles, for example, or that's, you know, you're immune for life. And because we have this difficulty with the diagnosis of COVID, in other words, people say they had COVID, and then, but we really don't have the proof. We don't have a good diagnostic method except for the history of what you had and so on. But because there's so much crossover between that and the influenza and other our viral illnesses, for example, in Germany, what they're calling COVID, when they looked at actually the viral studies, all the people that had COVID, they found that they were para-influenza. There, there was no SARS-CoV-2. They were all para-influenza and respiratory syncytial virus. All of them in the hospital that were called COVID. All the swabs came back either of those two things. So it just shows that it's very hard to make a diagnosis of COVID. If what we, we know through about uh, virology is, is true, and of course we're learning lots, is usually uh, one, one episode will provide you with immunity, mm -hmm. as far as we know, yeah. long-lasting yeah. and robust. Each, each time I've lost my taste and smell. Yes, but that has also occurred with other viruses. Sure. Okay, yeah. But, um, yeah, so uh, I, I, that's very interesting. We will keep that in mind, mm -hmm. but from what we get from the literature, it's one time and then you're, you're, you're immune. Okay, second question. Um, my aunt was vaccinated in September and five days later she died on her second vaccine. Uh, her autopsy report showed she had three heart attacks and had multiple blood clots in her organs, but they said she didn't die from the second vaccine. Mm -hmm. I think we can put a huge question mark after that. Yeah. Sorry to hear about that. Um, I was under the impression that the sermon was only dissolved or like soluble in alcohol. Is that incorrect? No, you can make it with water. Okay. Yeah, so you're talking about sermon, which you can get from pine needles. Yeah. By using the tips and so on, and no, it's usually you put them in, in, in water, which is not is up to a boil, but then let it stop. So just really, really hot water, and that's how you make the tea. Okay, and I had one more question. I don't really know. But you can have a big shot of whiskey afterwards if you want. <laughs> <laughs> in a tincture form. Um, okay, so I think it was Del Big Tree who was talking about something about um, basically once you're taking these vaccines, you're dependent on them to provide immunity, I guess. I guess my question is, for like a person who's gotten both their shots, obviously it's the clot shot, so it's that's not good to keep taking them, but is there, is it okay if they don't take it, or are they still like dependent on that? Does that make any sense? Uh, I think your question is maybe to do with boosters. And yeah, to do with boosters. take two shots, you know, um, has that ruined their immune system to such an extent by sometimes narrowing? It's a bit like you're, if you're looking, the theory behind that is if you're looking for the alpha variant, because the original shot was directing you that way, and then along comes the delta variant, you're more likely to catch it, right? 
And so it, if it means, it, so it's to do with, does the shot have uh, narrow your ability to fight back against other viruses? Is that kind of yeah. what you're saying? Yeah, I, I have some questions about that myself. I don't actually believe uh, that's um, a Van den Bosch's theory, and uh, I think a few others, Dr. Malone and Del Victory, seems to feel, feel that that's strongly about that. But you know, these these shots didn't do much in the trials in terms of preventing illness, right? So how much pressure are they actually putting on the virus? Not very much, right? If in the, in the Pfizer one, we only have 1.4 percent reduction in symptoms, not death or serious illness hospitalization of ICU admissions, right? So I don't think these shots really did very much to start with, so to expect them to put enough pressure on the virus to cause it to squirt out a few really bad variants, I think that's very unlikely, right? right. So I think people are probably getting adverse events from the shots that are being labeled as COVID. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so my question is that if the vaccine has a tendency to like reproduce itself within your body as a spike protein for an unknown amount of time, what's causing your immunity to wear off then after a couple of months? Yeah, so so the, the the way that the vaccine is supposed to work, because the spike protein is a foreign protein that shouldn't be in your body. Your immune system recognizes this foreign protein and makes an antibody against it. So that, to try and get rid of it, basically. So, um, what makes, so I, I suppose what, what would make your immunity wear off is just how long the antibodies last in your system. Um, if the antibodies just fade out after a few months, um, then your immunity goes in a few months. And so basically your body would need to keep on and on making new antibodies to keep that all going. And it's obviously not doing that, which is why after four months your immunity is gone. Okay, so in effect, would that mean that the vaccine has kind of worked its way out of your body then? By the That's time? a good question. That's a good question. But you see, what it, they're making antibodies to an artificial spike protein, right? Which may not cross-react with the real spike protein or to other organisms, that type of thing, right? So your question is a good one, because if we have a constant production of spikes, you think there'd be a constant production of antibodies, which would constantly protect you, right? But they're finding that's not the case. And, that, and it may be the way they measure protection. In other words, if the person has fewer symptoms, you know, the, the, they didn't get much benefit read after day one after the shot against getting infection. And now they're saying things like, well, you know, now it's just after six months, it's only 29%. I really have questions about that. Because the way they did the measurements was what they call um, relative risk reduction when they did the five all the big studies relative risk reduction that's like I say ninety five percent so on but actual their 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 um, their um, absolute risk reduction was only between 0.8 and 1.4 percent so it didn't do very much so I think the question there is really about what they mean by it gave you protection and it only lasted four months but it, you know what kind of protection did you get not very much okay. Like two different things. The spike protein and the amount of protection are two different issues there. Is that the end? Oh, is there one more question? Any more questions? We're good to go. Okay, I'm just going to let Carrie come back. She's not sleeping in the back there. Can you come up? She's here. One last question. Oh, okay. Your questions are challenging, though. Come on. When are we going to get back to normal? Let's <laughs> We will never be getting back to normal. Never. But we no, don't want. We don't want to get back. We don't want to go back to anything. We want to go forward. Yeah. We want to forward to a new paradigm, not just of medicine, but of life in general for humanity. Yeah. So don't go back to normal, please. Don't even try to go back. Let's go forward. Yeah.